Ignition sequence start. Six. Five. It's one small four, step for man. Two. One. Everything is going. Welcome to Stay Relevant, my wandering conversations with interesting people. I'm Mike Savola. Today, my guest is Richard Harrington, CEO of Red Pixel in Falls Church. Good to be talking to you. Thanks, Rich. Mike. Um, you know, you are one of the most wired people I know, it seemed. Um, and not in terms of energy, maybe in terms of energy. But <laughs> There's a little of that. <laughs> You know, you've written lots of books. You're you're a speaker at you know NAB, at GV Expo, at things things that I don't even know of. Um, your your online presence is amazing. You're everywhere. How do you, how do you do it? What's what's where do you where did you start and how did you get here? Well, I come from a family of educators, and um, that was always important to me. I was given the gift of being a decent teacher, and yeah, I have much better teachers in my own family. So I I grew up around teachers, and I saw how important it was to give back. Uh, the other thing that happened was I started my career as a journalist, and journalists have a deep feeling of truth and justice and that you make the world a better place with information. And then journalism, for the most part, kind of fell off of its rails. And so about 17, 18 years ago, I decided to leave the journalism world and focus on working directly with nonprofits, sometimes companies, high-tech groups that I find interesting cause-oriented groups, about half of our work is cause-oriented or issue-oriented, and we help them produce communications pieces, TV commercials, website content that helps them raise awareness. And so by doing these things, I found that I enjoyed it a lot. I was able to constantly get exposed to different topics. The journalist in me combined with the teacher in me has this thirst for knowledge, and so I'm always trying to discover new things. And then I was given a great gift of being able to communicate that to others. And so it's kind of wrapped itself up into this great career of being able to help a lot of people, get wonderful feedback of helping people. It's just awesome to start your day off with people giving you positive feedback about how you made their job better or their project better. And then we get to work with some cool clients. Now, it's not all roses and you know ice cream sundaes, but you know for the most part, especially when I look at some of my, my, my siblings um, and I see what other people have to do in their lives, I feel pretty blessed that I've got a great job. I get to help people. I get to work on all sorts of different things and meet all sorts of great people. And there's a lot of variety. So it's kind of cool. And uh, for somebody as highly visible and in demand as you seem to be, um, you're also really accessible. Whenever I have a question, um, it seems to, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I want to bother him. <laughs> so I try not to send you all my questions. Yes. But you're all, you're, you're, you're very willing to help and you're, you're very, um, very responsive. How do you do that? Well, the, the, the truth of the over, matter is, is it, it depends. No, no, no. It, it depends. I mean, you know, for example, um, you know, through the blogging and the website stuff we do, when I get good questions in, I try to address them and work that into future content. I can't respond to everybody who asks. You know, you get more response because we've known each other for a while and you know, I know you as a, you know, both as a professional resource and I know how much you do to give back to the community. And so I know that by helping you, it's going to help even more people. And so to be perfectly honest, I'm a bit selective, not in a vindictive way, but just I try to put my time where it's most good. So, you know, I, I'm very active and I run a forum on Premiere Pro on Facebook that's got now over 5,000 people. And while I can't answer every question, I was able to recruit 10 other great admins who really know their stuff and build a place that they feel like, oh, this is a great place to be involved. It's a high level discussion. I make sure that it doesn't get off track. If people are doing things that are weird, I kind of curtail it. Same thing with Publishing Photo Focus, which is a photography website. I've got a great team of a bunch of writers, and while I'm only able to maybe contribute one or two stories a week, we're putting out 20 stories a week. And so I've found that by focusing my efforts and taking my knowledge about teaching and publishing and identifying other great people who like to help others and make our industries, both the photo and the video industry, better, uh, that I can give them a platform. And that works out well. And so. I'm not always publishing or directly responding, but what I've tried to do is create an environment and a bunch of content that I've advocated and endorsed that's good. 
And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I publish or put out there, it's stuff that I've handpicked that writers working with me have created and we publish it. And so there's that. And then, you know, most people, if I do respond to them, I try to teach them and I say, look, it's really quite simple because I'm insane about publishing. If you just take what you're looking for and put Rich Harrington after it, you're probably going to find if I know the answer because you know, between my blog and Photo Focus and all the tutorials that I've done, chances are there's either a free answer or a very cheap answer through a site like lynda.com or a book where all of that knowledge is there. And so I started writing stuff down originally just for me because like I, I don't have a great long-term memory, believe it or not. And so I routinely look up things in my own books. And people are <laughs> shocked at this. They're like, I'm, they're like, you, you did this, did it, I'm like, yeah. Okay, let me check. Oh yeah, I did do that. And it doesn't all stick in there, but it's a lot like, that's how I treat my brain. I keep the most relevant information there and everything else, I always say, I don't know, um, I always jokingly say, I know all the answers, I just don't know the questions. And what I mean by that is that between what I know and the wonderful people that I know that work in different parts of technology or different parts, I know where to get pretty much any answer. And because I am willing to help people who also have questions, who are great at answering questions, we help each other, they'll step in and help somebody. And so um, my career started in Des Moines, Iowa, and it was a very small market for video. And I had a great mentor at the TV station. The first TV station I worked at, I almost got fired because I was not happy being in my place. I didn't understand why people who had less talent than me got all these opportunities and why I couldn't touch the computers. The only time I got called into the Avid is when they crashed the Mac. The next TV station I went to recognized my ability and said, okay, RTFM, you can use the Avid when you read the entire manual. And I did. And the guy's like, all right, I like you. You're willing to put the work in. And these great guys mentored me and they taught me After Effects and Photoshop. And I would come in for 30 hours a week on my time off and just shadow these guys and learned a bunch. And so I've always believed if someone was willing to put the work in just like I was, that you should let them have the answers. But I don't like just handing out answers. And so I always try to teach people how to find their own answers. So if I do take the time to respond, I try to convert them so that they can be self-sufficient going forward and that they can pay it forward. And you are somewhat self-taught as you kind of have alluded to there. And it seems to be that you've kind of, that's kind of how you stayed relevant. You, you're, you keep your hands yeah. in everything current and to do what you needed to do, you have to stay relevant and you have to stay current. Every book that I've written, every conference speech I've ever given, I sign up for it when I know somewhere between 30 and 50% of the information. When I go, all right, this is interesting, this is useful, and I am going to force myself to learn this. Because they say, if you really want to know something, teach it. Great. So I teach all sorts of things. I'm constantly changing what topics I speak at. I speak at different shows from digital publishing to other things. And I had the same problem in school. You know, my teacher back then said, you know, you need to focus on one area to be good. Well, look at where the market has changed. And that's not what happened. You know, people are expected to be multifaceted. And so I have things that I love and I have things I'm great at and they may not be things I love. But I've always forced myself to dig deep and learn something. And what I've always said to folks is my knowledge is not encyclopedic. I don't know everything there is about software. Uh, you know, people sometimes put me on these stump the expert panels at user groups. And I'm like, I don't know that answer. And they're shocked. It's like, yeah, I'm like, I know how to get my job done. And because I started in broadcast news and in the newspaper industry, those are both time sensitive things. So I always say, look, I know people that are better designers. I know people that are more creative. I'm fast and efficient, and that's all I've ever said. I'm probably one of the most qualified production artists out there. But I gather other great artists, and I work with other people who have tremendous talent. That's what we do here at Red Pixel. It's a room, you know, an office filled with talented people. And by bringing people around me that have more talent than me on different areas and giving them guidance and leadership and a project management system, we can do great things. So I think the relevancy there is don't be afraid to put yourself out there and force yourself to learn something by saying, all right, I am putting a stake in the ground. On this date, I'm going to be giving a presentation on this topic and I better figure it out. 
or I'm going to do this book and I half know what I'm going to do, but this comes next. And you don't have to get a book deal. Now with digital publishing, there's several books that I've just done on my own because I wanted to. Some are free and I release them on iTunes. And the fact that you put your work out there, you blog, you podcast, you get criticism. And if you can separate the hurtful criticism, the stuff that is you know, mean people being mean or trying to make themselves feel better by offering criticism that has no merits or no benefits to either party. When you can strip that away and you can find the useful criticism, uh, I am constantly challenged on if I'm doing things the best way or in a way that works. And by surrounding myself and taking other people's classes, when I, when I go to these conferences, I enroll in other classes, uh, I find that I'm constantly learning new things. And so I think it's just a matter of not being afraid to fail. But how do you prioritize? I know that you're, um, you, 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 you've kind of mastered that, but some, maybe somebody else who's kind of trying to learn this whole thing. Maybe they're, they're new to yeah. the whole blogging thing. They're into social media, but they're not, you know, there's so many things. There's, you know, Instagram, Twitter, there's, yeah. you know, Facebook, there's, there's LinkedIn, there's so many things, and so many more things just keep popping up. How do you know which one to use, how to use it, what works for you? It took almost five years for me to actually notice the results I was getting from using social media and blogging. Like, I didn't know until I started to learn to ask the right questions. When I started saying to clients, how did you hear about us? Or how did you find me? Or you know, who recommended me? Oh, I read your blog. Oh, I watched your class on Linda. Oh, I've got your books. Oh, and then I started looking and being smart and making sure that my company's link appeared in every book biography and every course description and every speaking thing. Oh, okay, I've got tremendous amounts of inbound links then it works. Um, and, you know, it's also consistency. Like, you know, every once in a while, you'll have a home run. You know, I wrote a post that challenged the New York Times on its review of Final Cut Pro 10, and they actually changed their review, and I, I made a lot that. of enemies on that. It was a tough one. I, I wrote a post that I just updated that was important to me about last year having an accident and uh, getting knocked down the stairs at a train station and doing, you know, 10 months worth of physical therapy and recovery to get back to walking. Uh, and the stories and the reactions I got from people about how people see, and it wasn't about me, it was about what is it like as I temporarily lived as someone with disabilities and the insensitivities and the problems we have with our infrastructure and how this impacts people. I was shocked and suddenly I was living it and I needed to share that. Well, that connected with people and helped. And, you know, I'll do a good course and people come back. So it's easy when you start paying attention to the feedback. When you get the feedback, you know that it's working. Um, other things, just simple metrics, signing up for things like Hootsuite, where you can track how many people are engaging with your content and resharing it and clicking it. People get obsessed with comments and likes and those things, and they're really meaningless. You know, that's just, it sprinkles. It doesn't do anything. It's just decoration on your post, and it doesn't matter. What matters is when you're getting the email or when a client is calling. We don't need a bunch of work. I mean, we, you know, I've got 12 employees, so I need a certain amount of work, but I don't need 2 million jobs. I don't need 2 million views on a post. I need about 60 clients a year to keep the shop running and to keep everybody employed and to live a life that I'm comfortable, a nice middle-class life. I don't want to live an extravagant life because I value my family time. Um, so I think it becomes a matter of just doing what's working. And I know that may sound silly, but you focus on what are you getting response from? And you have to make sure that that's tangible response and you pay attention to the real world comments. Don't care how many likes you get. Did you get five comments? Great. Did you respond to those commenters and did they respond back? Did you get the conversation going? That's where meaningful business opportunities come from. When you actually connect with somebody and start a conversation. It doesn't matter how many likes or stars or views you get. It matters what happens from it. Uh, the other thing is, is I don't use all social platforms. Part of what I do is a re-syndication strategy. So by using a blog and keeping all of my stuff in you know, a couple of places that are driven by blogs, it's very easy to republish that stuff, to go back into the archives and grab something and put it back out, to share a link. And so I always say, if I produce a piece of content, it's worth sharing five to 10 times and in, you know, in different places each time, not at the same time, not on the same network over and over again. By putting that in a few different places and time staggering it, you catch people at different times and different viewers. Maybe you read your social media over the morning coffee 
This person might do it at their lunch break. Other people are doing it at two in the morning. And so by mixing it up, you can learn from that. Lastly, though, you have to cut some stuff out. And so for me, you know, I've made a commitment that I'm exercising, you know, three or four days a week. You know, I, that happens. It has to happen. Otherwise, I feel bad. I don't like where I feel. You know, I can't, I don't have the energy I need. I've got scouting twice a week. You know, I'm a leader in my daughter's troop and my son's troop. And I've made that commitment to be there for that family time. My wife and I have a date night every other night. So it's not about, you have to have those tangible things. You know, you work to live, you don't live to work. And so you have to have that stuff that is meaningful to you. And then you fill in the rest. Beyond that, it's just a matter, and maybe this comes from directing live TV of multitasking. I'm standing in line at the grocery store. I can do 15 minutes worth of social media while I'm waiting in that line. I'm, you know, at an airport waiting for a plane. I could read a crappy magazine or I can catch up and go through my LinkedIn inbox and respond to every message that came in, you know, and make sure that I give a personal response. To me, I focus on responding to the people that responded to me. So you said I seem very accessible. I'm not accessible, but because we've had meaningful conversation and I know that it leads to good results, I'm going to be responsive to you and it works out well talking in voice and this is my levels and this is me. No problem. I know that fear. <laughs> so to me, you respond to the people that matter and you do the things that matter and you pay attention to that. So you don't worry about how many views you got or how many likes you got. You simply worry about how many real conversations you got into and then you keep going with those because that's where business opportunity comes from and that's where enjoyment comes from. If you love what you do for work and you meet great people who are equally passionate, well, then it's not really work. Then it's kind of like that thing that brought you into college in the first place. And you're like, oh, we're peers and we're both learning together and doing cool things together. And isn't this great? And we get paid. The more you can make it like that, the easier it is to not think of it as a job. It sounds like you have like a creative atmosphere where, I mean, in college, that, that was the whole thing. You get yeah. to do these cool things. You work with these cool toys and do all this stuff and not be afraid of failing yeah. um, and just have fun. And uh, if you can recreate that, that's kind of your goal. And you're learning and you're, you're moving forward and help, hopefully it's a collaborative effort. And it sounds like that's what you have here. Most of the time. I, I say <laughs> that there's, you know, there's three things I want out of any job. I want work that we're proud of. I want to get paid a fair price. And I want it to look good on my demo reel. And truth be told, I'll take two out of three. You know, like if they're great to work with and it looks great, maybe they have a smaller budget, some of our nonprofits, you know, maybe they're a really difficult client, but the work looks fantastic and they're paying for all of that PIA and the weekend work in the evenings. And I could pass that pay on to my employees and we can occasionally suck it up and put it in. That's great. It's going to work out, you know. It's not perfect here. I'm sure I irritate my employees. I try to make sure that when we're doing things or there's tension or there's misunderstanding, we calm down and talk about it or you know go have a meal together and try to talk things through so that people have that. I want them to understand why something is a problem. But because we focus on those criteria, it means that sometimes we have some really creative projects and maybe they don't pay so well, but we see the other benefits. And other times we know we're working hard and we're getting some great money for it. It seems like you have a great balance um, because uh, my whole thing was, you know, when the fax machine came in, <laughs> that yeah. way back when, it, the big thing was like, wow, you know, now we're going and, and we're going to be working, you know, pretty soon, four day work weeks. Everybody's mm -hmm. going to be having all this free time. Technology but only makes us work more. <laughs> that's exactly it. But it, it, I guess you, I, the key is to find the balance. And yeah. that's what you do here. I have learned the hard way from having burned out a few employees in the past that I can't expect my employees to be accessible all of the time. Uh, the more I give them flexibility so that they have time when they need it, the more they are willing to be accessible after hours. And we can use things like I could send a text saying, I need to catch up with you before tomorrow morning. Something came up with a client. Please get back to me. And maybe they call me at 11 o'clock at night. Maybe they call me at 7 in the morning. But they understand that if I reached out to them, it probably was serious. Uh, but, you know, when I come home at night, the cell phone goes on silent and I drop it by the front door and I have dinner and I spend two hours with my family. And my business partners know my home phone number, but my clients don't. And so, you know, I say to all my clients, I will get back to you within four hours unless I'm sleeping or on an airplane. And because they know I have that level of accessibility and I always make it there, 
they're fine. You have to unplug. And for me, we mentioned college before. Work is kind of like that. I probably work 80 hours a week, but I have a tremendous amount of time for my family. I still sleep. I still exercise. It's just I have an end goal in mind. You know, I don't want to work forever. But at the same time, you have to keep that all balanced. And so if you don't let technology rule you, but you use it as a tool, it's great. Where are we going in the future? Which specific technology? I mean, uh, or? Yeah, technology. Where, wh- you know, we've, we've come so far, it seems. Of course, you know, when we were inventing the wheel, I'm sure they said, we've come so far. <laughs> right. Oh, now you want to fly? It wasn't fast enough to just roll there quickly? You used to have to drag it all. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I know we can't envision a lot of this stuff, yeah. but it seems like there's not a lot further to go. There's not, I mean, a lot le- there's not a lot left. I mean, we're at a point now because access to information is so ubiquitous that so much of what's invented is simply cheaper or faster or easier. And that's okay. Making things more affordable, making them take less effort, making them more accessible is important. Um, I'm a social capitalist. And what I mean by that is I have strong socialist tendencies. Uh, I've been on welfare as a kid. My mom lost her job. I understand what that's like. But I believe if you work hard, you should be rewarded. So when I look at society as a whole, we have huge gaps in access to technology. We have huge gaps in access to education. That's why I publish so much stuff, and that's why I put so much stuff out for free. So I feel that, where do we go? Well, we take this incredible stuff we've invented, this great healthcare that we have, all of these things, and we start to free it up so it's less expensive. We make technology more accessible. We make education more accessible. If the bulk of the human population, if the 90% that doesn't have access to the stuff that the top 10% has had more access to that, we would be so much further along and such a better planet. Um, So I think where we get is we get smarter and we get more accessible and we get more the true word of democratic, you know, where people can access stuff and they can find what they need. And so hopefully that's where we go, you know, better, faster, cheaper, easier. And that would be fine as long as that's more accessible. And I think that's what we're seeing with this huge leap in online education, with all of these things of self-publishing. It is so easy to get your content and your voice out there. And that's what's exciting. You and I started careers where it took a satellite to get your stuff around the world. And now with a couple of clicks, you're publishing and anybody with a cell phone could download this podcast. It's amazing that those barriers are removed. What's more disappointing is how few people are taking advantage of the accessibility that's there. So I think if we want to change the world, if we want things to get better, people need to be more involved in self-advocacy and use the technology that we have. There's wonderful tools. There's terrible uptake. Great. It's a good message. My guest today has been Rich Harrington, tech guru, author, consultant, and motion graphics expert. His websites are redpixel.com, richardharringtonblog.com, and at redpixel for Twitter. Rich, uh, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, sir. The podcast is Stay Relevant, Wandering Conversations with Interesting People. Original music by Popmark Media on the web at popmarkmedia.com. See and hear more on my website at mikesabola.com. Until next time, try and stay relevant.